good afternoon sir um so it's been a ple- pleasure uh, uh talk uh, inviting you to the p- podcast and uh, today we'll be discussing and we'll like to ask you about your journey uh, and uh, the progress of uh, or the current state of development of neurotechnology and neuroscience in india question and there are some questions that i would love to ask about pursuing a phd degree and uh so on because i aspire to pursue one and there are just so many questions really? that i would uh, love to have answers to and probably answer sure. uh, answers to such questions are not available online or they're not as uh, uh comprehensive so i think your advice okay. would be uh, very helpful so we'll start with uh, your experience and journey so far you have been studying and working on modeling brain circuits for the past 30 years and you pursued yes. a bachelor's in electrical engineering from iit madras and then you went on to pursue a phd in neuroscience from uh, ut austin uh, around the 1990s so how did you yes. get interested in neuroscience and how was your experience transitioning fields at a time when unlike now resources were not as accessible or ubiquitous yeah yeah so good question uh, first of all let me thank you anantika for uh, doing this interview it's so uh, you know what a Uh, delight for me. So, I did B.Tech in electrical engineering. Uh, but towards the end, uh, a friend of mine got an article on neural networks. The neural networks was just uh, picking up in the so there, there was some revolution, some breakthroughs in the middle of the 80s, and then towards the late 80s it was just picking up, and there was a lot of hype around that. So, in that context, a friend of mine got a popular article on neural networks, and we thought it's very interesting. So, I applied. Uh, no kind of apply when i went to us uh, i found a faculty who is doing research in that i thought it got very excited and joined that person his name is professor jaydeep ghosh in ut austin so that's how my journey started so that was in electrical engineering department again the short neuroscience but at the end of phd i did phd in neural networks but at the end of it i thought uh, this is not neuroscience this is neural networks because i felt uh, that you know brain would be very different and it's just too dry it's too simplistic so i said i need to learn about how brain works so that's when for post doc i went to bayla college of medicine uh, joined a neuroscience department so that's when i joined this young faculty named uh, professor reed montague and for me it completely changed the course of events you know it's kind of set me on the path to you know on the path of neuroscience research uh because he was a very inspiring teacher inspiring researcher and like a fireball of energy and enthusiasm and that really rubbed off i think a little bit and so after working with him i worked in industry for some time and when i came back to india i said this is what i should do all my life and uh, so thing is talking about how to get into neuroscience like say if you see my uh, entry in neuroscience is to the side though Because the traditional route would be to do biology and then do neurobiology and do experiments and right. I think it's a very much more a long and arduous uh, you know path. Whereas uh, you know because India has lots of engineers, you know, computer science, I believe, and pretty much any from any branch of engineering, you can easily get into some kind of a neurotech or neuro application area very easily. And then if you are interested further, you can go into neuroscience proper. That's an easier route for a lot of Indian students, rather than traditional thing because the traditional route is very expensive, and uh, you know good neurobiology labs in India are very few. I mean, hardly you can count them on the hands of just of you know two hands maybe. So it's a much difficult uh, path, but neurotech is a much easier path. Only thing is you need to learn one branch of engineering thoroughly, whatever it is you are doing, mm-hmm. right? And then we pick up a little bit of. applications stuff and maybe in find it people can do like uh, you know some application in neurotech a lot of people are doing neurotech in india and a lot of iits and you see faculty doing some something to do with neurotech and then you can plan your journey further uh, i hope i answered your question yes i actually did and it's good that uh, if your answer was quite reassuring because i also have an engineering background and i do uh, and i also want to work uh, in the field of neurotechnology specifically and also computational neuroscience and 
Yeah, so I do not have a background in biology, but working in research labs and attending journal uh, yeah. clubs uh, has helped me in the biology yeah. aspect. And my background in signal processing and machine learning has helped me in the communication. Yeah, Transitioning from uh, purely machine learning and signal processing to electrophysiological yeah. signal processing. Mm-hmm. And yes, that has been very really helpful. Yes. And it's good to see. Yeah. Uh, when I joined NeuroTechX India community or even the global community, that there are quite a few yeah. engineers who want to make this transition and they are coming together yes. to make this happen. Yes. Uh, yes. Why, yes. That's I, an I easy think, route. That's a very happy route. It's comfortable. Yeah. And it's also a very exciting and interesting route because since uh, neuroscience is such a multidisciplinary field, uh, yes. it's yes. easy to uh, have, be good at one part of it. Uh, and Yes make the shift. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. So then since you have been in this field for almost 30 years, that's three decades, yeah. I have to ask you this. Uh, yeah. How has the field changed in 30 years and what is the most surprising, exciting development for you? Yeah, big question because uh, neuroscience is so vast. Maybe I can talk about it the way I look at it. I mean, at least a part of it that I understand. It. Because 90s were called the decade of the brain. And, Yes, uh, Obama administration is putting a lot of money and all that. So a lot of neuroscience research got funded. And uh, if you look at, uh, I'll talk a little bit about neural network research. So neural networks after the end of 80s, uh, it's really, it's arrived. And a lot of developments were happening in the 90s. A lot of applications in every domain they were getting applied. And around the same time, a lot of techni- neuroscience methods were getting you know, more and more sophisticated. Mm-hmm. Like imaging technologies, electrophysiology, you know, single cell, ion channel, all mm-hmm. that, right? Neurochemistry. And so the methods became very important. Uh, so in the neural net, net network area, by the end of the century, right? Actually, there's, there was a lot of hype about neural network, a lot of expectation of neural that that was beginning to chill out a little bit. So people are thinking that it's too much hype and they're not really that good. So there's actually there's a lull in research towards the end of 90s, so by the end of the century. Now, until in mid 2000, first decade, around 2005, this paper by Hinton, classic paper by Hinton, and colleagues has come out about deep networks. And that's when that's what has triggered the modern evolution of deep networks. It's not really new because uh, in the previous neural networks are also deep. It is just that you know, people have simulated larger networks and that becomes triggered this whole evolution. In the neuroscience side, there's a lot of focus on methods and technologies that will let you measure brain in various ways at different scales, whether it is single cell level, subcellular level, molecular level, I mean, the methods are just immense. So, uh, so that almost drove research. In fact, as a scientist called Sebastian Sion, he says when he was doing PhDs in very career stage, he asked the senior, what's the best way to have a great career in neuroscience? His senior says, create some new neuroscience method because everybody will use your tool that everybody will cite your work and you'll become popular. Okay. So, so in fact, that gives an idea of where neuroscience is going today and that the amount of funding that's going in, right, into generating data, because we're also in this big data era, that, that's the mm-hmm. kind of spirit of the times. So the focus is on generating more and more that somehow there is this faith that or a belief or a superstition uh, that if you generate more data, you'll understand brain ultimately. But point is, more data will be only more confusing. More data will not give you more insights into the brain. More data will just increase the confusion. So you'll see, see the data so conflicting, which is true, right? Read any paper on neuroscience, you'll say, look, that paper said this, this paper, my study is like this, and then people try to make a very verbal, sloppy synthesis, and end up, end up so you don't learn anything. So what I find lacking in neuroscience is what, you know, my lab science work, just what I've been writing about for a long time. Just like in physics, right? You see, if you see how physics has evolved, if you see astronomy, right? People have, have been up, as observing uh, heavenly bodies for thousands of years, for millennia. But they, they didn't understand why the planets are moving the way they were moving. They didn't even know that sun is a central solar system. That was so backward. So we had to change the paradigm, right? Uh, to uh, get a better understanding of planetary motion. And then we'll talk about the forces that control planets. So earlier people were just fitting trigonometric series and, you know, predicting, you know, publishing timetables of planetary motion. They didn't understand why they're moving like that. They didn't know about gravity and inverse square law. All that came with 
once that came newton could capture planetary motion into equations that's a celestial mechanics but until then people were publishing tables and tables and kept on correcting tables which are totally logic why is it like that so a lot of some of us believe that uh, neuroscience is at that stage very observational lots of observational data but the theory is there but it's very weak it's, it's like very patchy bits and pieces here and there but like you know i guess you are an electrical engineer i suppose yeah right in electrical engineering you have this maxwell equations any electrical phenomena comes out of these equations or some variation of them. so beautiful so thorough right so encompassing enclosure yeah. whereas where is that kind of theory in neuroscience it's a lot of patchwork of ideas and concepts and laws and rules learning rules so i'd like in my life i would like to see neuroscience develop like electrical engineering people will hate me for it you know so logical these are the first principles chapter 1 chapter 2 chapter 3 first principles everything else is a derivative from that is a elaboration of those first principles textbooks today in neuroscience are not written like that i mean you have big section of textbook is cell level another section is molecular level another section at you know, systems level but it's all apples and oranges i mean yeah. there is no yeah. why There is no why is it like that? You know, we don't know. But this is observations yeah. at multiple levels. Yes. So I this has to change. This is a problem. So when you talk about that Indian centering neuroscience, so like I said, since we have large engineering community students, you know, they can enter neuroscience. For practical reasons, I said it's simple. But not only that, even for very profound academic reasons, I think a lot of engineers should jump into neuroscience. The India engineers have a very different way of looking at the systems. Right, our perspective is you know we say this is the box input output. Let's define the box. I don't care what's inside the box. Right, if you want, I can expand the box into three other boxes. Then let's talk about those boxes. And so this box and interface is a beautiful. That's the whole idea of systems. It makes simple systems so simple. They look very obvious. I mean, we engineers know it how to do it. You know, at the back of the back of the hand. So that same thinking, if it goes into uh, neuroscience it will clarify the brain it will make brain very obvious very simple whereas right now it is hard to find it looks very scary scary out here yes i agree with uh, the fact that uh, where you mentioned that there are a lot of observations in neuroscience and uh, often uh, to if you compare two papers on the same concept they might often produce contradicting observations and that's yeah. often because there's a there's no standardization of paradigms between uh, uh those papers which is something that i have noticed and it's quite yeah. confusing to me too and this you just laid the perfect groundwork for my next question which i keep thinking about and asking people is that how has the development of machine learning deep learning and the big data uh, seen the capacity to handle larger data sets how has this impacted computational modeling of the brain networks and as you said uh, is it making it more confusing or is it uh, leading towards a different direction for oh, beautiful question because it, it goes to the heart of the problem because if you look at the two fields right now computational neuroscience and deep networks or in machine learning let's say that two fields yes. right now they're pretty pretty independent pretty you know separate in computational neuroscience there's a tendency to model brain extreme details there are there also there is yeah. levels of abstraction you can take but hardcore computational neuroscience believes in modeling brain at very detailed level right for example you know you can even model at single neuron single fiber you can really yeah. go over to that <laughs> but point is if you want to understand brain at level of concepts and all that is systems it's very hard to learn understand anything if you go to the level of single cells and fibers and things like that. so the big question the billion dollar question in any science is a, what is the right abstraction what is the correct way to describe anything yes. right it's there's no ready answer to that just because you go to the smallest scale that that's not necessarily correct correct take the example of fluid mechanics right you know you might have done some you know studies of course on fluid mechanics that like fluid, fluid flows and laminar flow turbulent flow now fluid is a bunch of molecules agree but if you try to explain describe fluid flows in terms of molecular collisions it look extremely complicated yes yeah. we might have the computing power to study fluid flow using molecular collisions at very small volumes but it's it's absurd it's extremely complicated whereas in engineering we do this thing called we invoke this abstraction called fluid 
it has dens which has density and pressure and velocities and you have you know streamlines if you describe using navier stokes equation this you know a lot of conservation of mass and conductivity and then that's a beautiful uh, presentation there's a right representation for fluid anything else will make it a mess yeah. right and uh, that that conceptual conceptualization is captured by a very precise equation some other equation will not work for fluids a diffusion equation may not work for fluid fluids navier stokes equation alone will work for it and uh, work and then you can do wonders with it brain is not different brain is just a piece of matter this is a biological system it's still always laws of physics right so like an engineer we should hit up on the right abstraction right way to describe brain once you hit it, you know arrive at that the right mathematical description it look very simple it look just like any of your op amps or you know or signal you know, signal filter it look as simple as that i mean engineers are not uh, you know alien to complex systems we build vlsi chips with you know billions of transistors for uh, you know boeing aircraft with millions of components and complexity is not new to us why do these people act as if they have alone no complexity right so the only thing is we, we are able to master the complexity because we put it in a nice conceptual framework yes so it's easy to master complexity to just describe detail after detail it will look mind boggling but that's not a way to handle complexity so you need to put in a conceptual framework therefore i am saying if engineers more and more engineers jump into neuroscience and start looking at things if that i brain will look very simple so one problem with this whole thing which which hopefully will be solved is look at neurological disorders or neuropsychiatric disorders i mean how many of the neuro neuro disorders can we say we can cure cure many like malaria you know you take malaria drug you are done rabies vaccine i take those shots and i'm done Mm-hmm. Tell me one serious neurological disorder, your psychiatric disorder, where I can say you take this pill, take this set of injections, you are done. No, not a single one. Why is that? These are called multifactorial diseases, disorders. There are many factors, and they are not pure genetic disorders. There is a genetic influence, but you know you will have some 30 genes for one disease, so which is observed. So what do you do with it? So you need to understand its systems level at network level. But even that, using very precise, appropriate abstractions, there there's a lot of research to be done. So if you just take the brute force you know, approach, just because you have a lot of money and a lot of equipment, I mean you are going to. You know, it's like a, I don't know, landmine. It's, it's just so much of work to be done with uh, no simple outcome coming out. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So if you take this approach, I think we'll be in a better position to. to understand this is first first of all and maybe hopefully treat them because we understand that's that's a very huge thought like that's a lot yeah. of order for thinking i mean yes that is something that i keep thinking on for a very long time so there is this trend going on on twitter i don't know if you're aware of it it is asking people in the field different fields this question what is going to be the next biggest question or the biggest question that uh, the field in our case neuroscience should answer in this decade or this next decade so obviously i mean i don't know uh, as a neuroscientist and also as an indian like considering that we have this huge spiritual tradition all that i would say the mind body problem is the biggest question because i think it's not just because it won't be once you go sufficient deep into it you will find that it's not a neuroscience problem at all it's a much bigger problem it will have to if if you really go sufficient deep into it because a traditional view about this problem in the neuroscience like even 80s and 90s is that very simple materialist thinking that is there's no such thing as mind at all there is only brain and whatever we we call mind is what they call emergent effect yeah. nobody knows what that means you push them a little bit what is emergent effect you push people a little bit they won't have any idea but there are this buzzwords people like to throw and i think there is a illusion of understanding when you throw certain words right like placebo effect everybody thinks i understand what is a placebo effect i never understood so like that this emergent effect is everybody thinks they understand something you know it's something sparks in their mind when they hear but it doesn't it's rubbish it's just a statement of ignorance But if we really go deep into this mind body problem uh, and have a handle of because whatever proposals people have said, there is talk and crick hypothesis about 
gamma synchronization being a correlate to sensory awareness. That went to a point, and then there's even more of sophisticated theory by Tony and Edelman on this uh, information integration theory. That went much further, but even now they are even debugging that, and there's a lot of counter evidence and all that. So we don't know what is the real theory of consciousness, purely from a conscious from a neuroscience point of view. I'm not talking about religion, spirituality, all that. I mean, purely from neuroscience, how can you approach a problem? Now, Anil said in UK, people say that he has done a lot of interesting work. I'm not aware, but you know, I need to I'd like to learn more about it. But we have done some work on a model of free will. That is, see, there are two kinds of moments. There are moments where, uh, let's say, you throw a ball at me, I catch it. So that moment of my hand is completely driven by external stimulus. Mm -hmm. So it's a stimulus-driven moment. The other kind of moment is what we call voluntary moment. In fact, uh, the textbook just defines voluntary moment. Really, we don't know what it means, how to define. What is that voluntary? The voluntary means some you initiating moment, right? Where is what is that you? Where is that you? We really don't know. We throw words and you know just kind of gloss over the very difficult concepts. So, so we propose that this willed action must be. I am a simple dualist. Okay, I don't know what mind is, but there is such a thing called. Mind. And I would like to put a volume, but a control volume, like an interface around the brain, and say mind is interacting with the brain. I am with you know all these guys like Karl Popper and Sir John Eccles, and that. I belong to that camp. Now, if you want to put me into the camp, I would like to lean more towards that. And we said, I said that you know if you assume that willed action is a very weak signal, a very weak influence, trying to produce movement out of out of this heavy thing called you know nervous system and body and physical matter. Now that weak signal has to be amplified, just like you capture radio signal and amplify it, right? Using your you know, filters and tuner circuit and all that. You need to amplify this weak signal. So how do you do that? So I propose that there is a cortico basal ganglia circuit, which is capable of phenomenon called stochastic resonance. This is a physics phenomenon, right? Because there's huge details. So we have written a paper on that, and I can share it at some point if you're interested. But that circuit basically amplifies the signal. And the signal builds up. And once it builds up sufficiently and crosses the threshold, then action uh, originates. But okay, so build, build action is a slow process. It is a slow buildup of activity. This is a theory. But still, it has not been tested. This build action model I was talking about that tries to give a theory of how will is a weak signal. And it is picked up by the brain and amplified by the brain circuits, particularly cortical basal ganglia system, using a phenomenon called stochastic resonance. Right? Just like in radio, you take funeral circuit and amplify a signal, capture a signal, and amplify it using an amplifier. You amplify this signal. And uh, the signal amplification fails in disorders like Parkinson's. And that signal buildup doesn't occur to the full extent. And you know that. You know, this is called readiness potential. It does not uh, to the full extent in PD patients. So like that, it will be nice to develop theories just like you know any other sort of topic of science and test even the ideas of consciousness, uh, right? So I have a lot of con confidence and also I'm excited that it will lead us to really deep waters. I think it will go to the point where it will uh, you know, suggest radical revisions of physics, or, you know, ideas in physics. It won't just be, it won't stop at the boundaries of neuroscience. I agree. I hope I live to that point to see all these developments. But uh, I think something big is in the, you know, on the horizon. We need to push it. We need to accept the problem. We cannot gloss over it. We cannot throw some random terms and scuttle the investigation. We should go, you know, you know, fearlessly wherever the investigation takes you, right? And then, the, no matter how far it is, you know, how how, how you know, uh, radical or you know, new it is, mm -hmm. we should just follow the lead. And uh, see where it takes. I think it will completely, it will be like another relativity, right, happening in 21st century. Definitely. In fact, uh, we are now working with a string theorist uh, here, mm -hmm. called Ayan Mukhopadhyay, who is a theoretical physicist, a string theorist. Mm -hmm. We are developing a theory of hippocampus, which is a part of the brain, mm -hmm. using quantum theory. It's a quantum theoretic model of hippocampus. It's still in, in under construction, it's still in the works. But once we work out all the details and we're able to come to theory, I think it will be very exciting. Uh, mm -hmm. right? uh, so we need to see. I mean, there's no harm in trying out something, you know, wonky. It's okay. Right? Yeah.
that is a very exciting only last week i was uh, discussing understanding brain from a quantum theory uh, perspective but then i completely got uh, overwhelmed by the content so yes, hopefully i'll get some more meetings with you and understand this because it's something that i to frequently have discussions on or, or maybe naive arguments about because i do not have that or knowledge but definitely it's something that is a very uh, interesting question uh, yeah. so yes that is a lot to think about uh, so the uh, next question that i was uh, have wanted to ask you is that uh, with all these method methodologies that you uh, said that people have been uh, working on in neuroscience are we even closer to understanding the brain yeah so thing is right now what we have is mountains of data right, right of different animal species at different scales and all that if we also make a commensurate progress in the theoretical side especially if we can hit up on the right theory to take an all all so for example even if relativity if we take an example mm -hmm. before einstein came up with this interpretation of equations there were other interpretation of special relativity which are, which are not correct Mm -hmm. or which are not as good maybe i can say that right lorenz lorenz thought that length contraction special relativity is an automatic phenomenon where the piece of matter actually gets compressed by vertical forces and sense said no it's not the object is getting compressed length itself is getting altered the space time dimensions are getting distorted which is a much more radical idea than thinking that you know some object is getting compressed by some forces so so there is a right math and there is a wrong math right i mean yes. so we need to take upon the right set of equations right understanding of brain function uh, uh, then uh, it will be a revolution right yes. so that that has to happen just because you have more data it is not going to cut it true that is there there is a lot of there is an inundation of data i think which yeah. needs to be sorted um i mean at least put into perspective um yeah. so uh, you have been in india again you came back uh, to india uh, quite a few decades ago so i think you'd be the best person to ask about the current state of development in india both in academia and as well as industry and probably the collaborations between industry and academia so uh i don't uh, so you must be aware that uh, last year the investments in neurotech industry doubled in spite of the pandemic more startups are working on uh, not just neuropharma but in other domains of neuroscience and big firms are also investing in neuroscience related projects is india too seeing the in this increase in industry focus of neuroscience on neuroscience so this doubling you are saying world over or in india world over Oh, okay, that's a very welcome development. I mean, uh, happy about it. India, I'm not sure of the statistics, but uh, I I hope new tech will pick up in a big way. A lot of potential. So that's a low-hanging fruit, right? Because we can we can you know discuss about you know, developments in consciousness and all that, but mm -hmm. that's fringe. That's far out. But what we can get immediate benefit out and some mileage out is out of new tech, and we can we are easily we have the talent pool, we have the funding levels. right uh, and we should cover that ground very quickly it, right. it's yes. it's obvious to me it's a no brainer i mean no fun in mm -hmm. uh, to get into this kind of a brain science right so i mean i hope it happens right i don't see why it shouldn't happen because we have all the pieces in the, in the right. mm -hmm. now one thing about neuroscience in, in india is so right now what is happening is since i i'm in indian academics i tell you a change that has happened in indian academics over the last couple of decades since i joined in 2000 in iit See, in the early years, there was hardly any talk of research. Only individuals used to do some research out of their own passion. But otherwise, it's like you know, it's not something that you have to do for sake of your promotion. That it's if you want, you can do. That's the kind of thing. But in the middle of 2000s, the first decade, right? A lot of people came from outside. A lot of younger faculty were trained in trained abroad and all that. Where research is a normal thing. You have to do research. There's no option. So they brought in that culture, and suddenly, you know, research levels have gone up. began to go up in all iits mm -hmm. but what happened other development that happened is very quickly the quantification of research in terms of 
metrics and HNDSS and citation, all that became very important very quickly. Actually, normally what happens is if a kid is studying, you first let the kid grow at his or her own pace and pick up interest in the subject. And then you talk about exams and marks and measurement, right? But our systems didn't have much time or to incubate and become, create that kind of a very genuine, deep research culture. That's my impression. Where you really fall in love with research and you know this becomes a very deep thing. Once you gain that momentum sufficiently, it takes a couple of decades easily. Then you start measuring, yeah. right? And then you know uh, screening and filtering and all that. But anyway, this kind of measurement has become a big thing. So because of the measurement, what happens is a lot of this measurement uh, in measuring issues come, are in the best. So they measure how you are doing. Okay. That means you have to fall in line with whatever they are thinking is good. Is the right way to go. Mm-hmm. If you don't, if you deviate, uh, you are in trouble, right? So because of that compulsion, we'll end up doing what the Europeans are doing or what Americans are doing. What's the point? That's not research. I mean, research means you should be able to like kind of boldly go where no man has ever gone. I and mean, we should be able to try different directions, even if it is likely to fail. It's okay, right? If you don't try out, venture out into new directions. How are you going to do useful research? You only do very safe research, which is of not much of interest to anybody, right? So the extreme measurement, which is actually getting worse every year, will force you to do only routine stuff, right? Whereas you say, look, yeah. well, part of your work, I don't care what you do, just mm-hmm. right, knock yourself out. And that should be the spirit of Indian Academy. Uh, I don't know, until that happens, it's very doubtful if you can come to really anything really significant. <laughs> Uh, right. I agree. So there, there is a problem. There's a problem. I see the problem. Yes, that measurement metric does uh, impact a lot of decisions when it comes to what projects to per- pursue. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, uh, but uh, if India was to uh, overcome this and uh, and assuming that uh, the in pick up projects that are more uh, that can be easily adopted by the industry that is not like uh, you know the fringe topics as you said so yeah, what would yeah. be the uh, topics uh, that should uh, you know gain traction or, or or are gaining traction in india for according to you see but off the top of my head i can say something like eeg for example right now all the signal processing guys can get into it there's a lot of gaming potential mm-hmm. a lot of neuro feedback potential so therapeutics can use mm-hmm. it um, of course, there's a lot of uh, fundamental science aspects also, but it's, and uh, this is characterization that biomarkers and huge number of things done just looking at each, right? And BCIs, right? It's a pretty huge thing. Now, practically from every branch of uh, engineering, you can have in, make inroads into neurotechnology. Like, for example, take computer science, and one example I can think of is if you take EEG data. Right, how, in applications in surgery or anesthesia, right? How do you know if the subject is sufficiently anesthetized so they can start cutting the body? Um, is there an algorithm? Apparently, there's a company which has a proprietary, you know, IP on the algorithm like that, but it's not openly known. Similarly, epilepsy prediction, right? When are you going to hit my next epilepsy? If you do some continuous monitoring, can you predict it at least within a few minutes so that if I'm driving a car, I can pull over and Right. So similarly, mechanical engineering, if you take uh, one of the very old application in this case, EEG driven wheelchair, like a former student of mine who worked in EPFL Switzerland. Mm-hmm. At that time, so it was almost 10 years old project now. Uh, EEG driven wheelchair, where the guy is sitting in the wheelchair and then just by brain waves, uh, you can control the motion of the wheelchair, you can break, you can turn, avoid obstacles. I mean, uh, if it is done 10 years ago with the current type, you know, technology and computing power and cloud computing, how hard is it? I haven't, I don't see that happening in India. I mean, I, don't, I haven't seen it anywhere. These are low hanging fruit, I mean, very easily we can do. Similarly, like chemical engineering, applications in pharma, modeling drug action, right? Mm-hmm. And huge field. Because now one uh, big trend in uh, neuroscience is, in computational neuroscience, is something called computational neuropharmacology. Because the traditional route to drug testing is, you know, you, okay, you do you find some candidate molecule and then you do mall bio and cell bio and animal studies and clinical studies. You know, this route is a classical route, which is very expensive. 
but with whatever physiology and chemistry that you know, if you can create large simulators mm -hmm. that will show the drug action from molecular level all the way to the behavior and symptoms. And if that works out only, then you do the practical uh, experiments. That will save from a billion dollars per drug, it will maybe go down to $10 million a drug. I mean, oh, that's a major saving. So the, but these are just coming. So we have immense amount of talent in, in a computer computation, in a computer science. We just have to aggregate them. Only thing is create a constitutional function because you can't expect these guys to go through the traditional training of neurobiology and engineers hate biology. You can't expect them to learn this whole thing. You know, they'll say, you know, what's up? I don't like this. You need to make it simple. So with that uh, idea in mind, I've written this book called uh, Demystifying the Brain. Oh, okay. Yes, I have heard about yeah. this. I... So, so this basically tries to explain neuroscience to an engineer without using too much of biology jargon. And ex explains the computational concepts of neuroscience right to a biologist without using too many equations. So it has a dual audience in mind. So if you can just pick up some basic neuroscience, after that, you only worry about your engineering branch. That anybody can do, right? Any engineer can do that. So like that, we can make quick progress in neurotech. I mean, it's uh, very exciting and quite doable. We should do, I don't know what's happening on the ground because I know Karthik and through Karthik, I know other people, but otherwise I don't know much what's happening on the ground. But it's eminently doable thing. It has to be done. Uh, have been wanting to pursue a PhD, not right out of my bachelor's. I would like to get some experience and then hopefully pursue a PhD. But then I have uh, many doubts uh, regarding this route. Uh, most uh, the most important one being how much preparation should someone have to want to pursue or before wanting to pursue a PhD in neuroscience or even um, neurotechnology, like maybe through electrical engineering or computer science. What should be how how do how does someone know that yes I am ready to pursue a PhD? No, I think once you are sure of your own engineering branch, whatever it is, mechanical, chemical doesn't matter. Uh, getting into neurotech is straightforward. Within a couple of months of exposure to some relevant concepts, mm -hmm. you can get into the game fully, right? But if you want to go into neuroscience proper, what I suggest is you go for a master's in neurotech, some neurotech topic. Okay. Uh, and then for PhD, you get into any branch of neuro, you know, neuroscience. Um, and people have done that, like my students who have done, okay, but some PhD to postdoc. We have done computational neuroscience with me, have gone ahead to do experimental work. They picked up pretty well. I mean, I myself have very sloppy hands, so I haven't. I'm not confident of doing a, doing a single experiment. But uh, my students are able to do it. So I think it can be done. So from your engineering background, the neurotech is straightforward. Once you spend a year or two there, getting hard into hardcore neuroscience is pretty straightforward. Uh, and do you think that uh, the student uh, should be aware of an exact question when they want to pursue a PhD? Or is it that they should be aware of a, a very specific topic, or is it okay not to be aware of such things? No, so, so if you let us say you spend after BTEC a couple of years in MS, tech or MS, mm -hmm. and doing tech. But what I suggest even to my students here, and I give talks about it in you know, colleges, that is in addition to the coursework, mm -hmm. uh, students should should familiarize themselves with popular science books. Uh, you know, popular articles, which are which address general reader. They're not too technical. Anybody can read and understand. Mm -hmm. That will be a wide exposure of the field. And once you find something interesting, which is, which is how I started. Somebody gave me an article on neural network, which is a popular article. And then I said, man, this is great. And so that, that route is uh, quite open to everybody, right? Because it, what happens is when you get into somebody's lab, that lab will have some very focused objectives. If you get into that lab, you already signed up on that. That is, you'll be doing only one of one of one of, one of those two three things, True. right? But if you want to know what you want, then mm -hmm. wide reading at, at this popular level is quite essential. Right. right. So that's how you can choose the lab appropriately. Right. So uh, 
there is a worry amongst uh, many people who aspire uh, pursue a phd uh, and if, if, if you want to move to the industry after a phd they think that a phd will narrow down the possibilities uh, or job opportunities and restrict them to a topic of specialization uh, i would like to know your take on this is it so yeah so this is a problem in so this is a problem in biology in general mm-hmm. because we do traditional biology if you want to go to industry then pharma is one big area okay but uh, to talk about neuroscience phd i mean other than academics of course that's a natural thing mm-hmm. academics you want to go to industry in neuroscience neurotech is the best option right and there are some big companies doing neurotech but uh, they will they still somewhat you know, pockets um then the other route is starting a startup because as a phd you will have some unique knowledge that you have gained in that field right so you are you are in the best place to start a startup because you now the field is open it's not a mature field at least mm-hmm. everybody is at you know so that's another route but i'm really surprised why neurotech hasn't caught on already at the level of let's say cardiac technology right you have all the artificial valves and all things so huge uh, But I read an article even almost uh, five six years ago that neurotech is all set to overtake cardiac tech by such and such year, which already must have passed. But um, because for me it's 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 a natural it's it has to happen. It's a question of time. So the other thing is startup growth is other other option. Yes, actually, I feel that that is more uh, because uh, for any industry to be interested, uh, people need to be aware uh, too. And I think there's a lot of stigma when it comes to the brain or any or yeah. using any technology on the brain, which yeah. is I think uh, what's hindering uh, the whole yeah. uh, consumer industry at least. Uh, yeah. and also as you said the lack of uh, direct uh, treatments or solutions to many uh, neural disorders which uh, yeah. you know unlike cardiac disorder a uh, cardiac problems yeah. which have solutions i think that is these two are the reasons i feel that uh, yeah. it has not caught up with the industry but i think the industry yeah. is doing better in that to its against in for the past year or so or even a little yeah. more uh, yeah. and now that we are on the topic of industry i have seen uh, while looking for opportunities uh, in neurotech startups or big firms which focus on neurotechnology that there is a high demand for phds um but uh, as more and uh, as neurotech gains a lot is gaining traction and more and more engineers are wanting to get into the field where do you think people with bachelor's or masters degree fit in and how what sort of opportunities or roles should they target or do you think that these phd roles will transfer to them eventually or in a few years in a few years somewhat unlikely i think the trajectory one can visualize for a young graduate he start with some thing kind of a data analytics kind of expertise right take some course and find you mm-hmm. then machine learning then deep learning with that background it is uh, somewhat it's now comfortable to get into neuroscience because you understand how networks work how networks can run right with that conceptual paradigm you can now start understanding how brain as a network works right then you go deep into brain and then take some part of the you know, study some part of the brain and get expertise with that you take now it's deep waters it takes some time um so if you looking at a startup which should have an ecosystem where you have a phd at the top right where uh, that person will come with a lot of expertise mm-hmm. focused expertise in some specialized area then the master's level machine learning experts and then data analytics chaps at a junior level and maybe a consultant coming from neurobiology and a doctor on board this is a kind of composition you know you can you are looking at a typical neurotech company so you will have it's for everybody at in a different levels of expertise uh, I, i don't know if i answered your question yes um, that is what i also think so hopefully i think that uh, as the uh, com- uh, startups grow bigger there would be more positions uh, that do not require a phd 
hopefully that is what yeah. i hope for yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah uh that is but i think uh, the timeline in which that's going to happen is debatable or up for discussion yeah 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 yes or uh, uh, one practical way to handle that is can stay in ml uh, data analytics kind of space for some time Mm -hmm. Once you get a good opportunity in some European company, jump. I mean, don't wait for it to mature. But it might take some time. It will right. happen in other markets. That is possible. Right. That is, uh, I think, a good uh, tip to follow to be in the industry and still yeah. pursue your love for neuro tech. Yeah. And hopefully, then they have uh, more more positions or at least more options yes. for uh, enthusiasts. Um, without a phd degree so yes, with yeah. uh, and so moving on uh, from uh, phd in academy and industry i would like to discuss the future of the field and the role of communities like uh, neurotech x global community as well as india chapter in uh, in uh, helping this uh, field grow in india and globally and get more people aware so uh, i would like to ask that with the growing interest of engineering students in neuroscience and neurotechnology what are your thoughts on introducing neuroscience programs in undergraduate engineering uh, uh, degree as like neurotech uh, neuroscience courses uh, as minors perhaps uh, yeah. so that uh, people uh, people uh, in with engineering background have more experience or have uh, more opportunities to understand uh, this field in more detail yeah so thing is it is i think it's it has to be done it can be done but if you do it in a traditional way like you know we have a textbook called candle and shorts mm -hmm. it's like a bible for neuroscience if you start teaching that to an engineer at undergrad level they will not know right but uh, something simpler you know the way it has to be taught to an engineer if that can be done if it can be packaged like that all right so if the student already has some background in ml and deep learning with that point of view now let us look at brain then it, it it can be packaged in a way they can understand that must be done in addition you can identify the uh, neurotech and neuroscience faculty all over india and you know, through the tech network right? mm -hmm. and uh, let them give talks in colleges at least online talks and mm -hmm. create awareness uh, right. that, that, that that has with them that's a good way to spread awareness and then i hope more startups come over uh, that's only you know wish for thing because there are a lot of potential a lot of nice things are there and yes, that also takes the power to some there are actually quite a few uh, startups coming up in india in this neurotech field i don't know if you're aware of them uh, i think and i don't know how many are uh, still in stealth mode or not so i don't want to say that, say it out loud but i think there are uh, six to seven that i know of personally uh, as friends or who are founders so i think that's quite a big number and they are already in their uh, like received funding uh, beyond seed funding so it's very exciting um, and yes and uh, and quite uh, and there was and it's not uh, just uh, and the funding is also from uh, big venture capitalists so that's also i think uh, quite uh, highlighting the fact that they are ready to take the risk which also means that maybe the industry and the consumers are ready for it apart from uh, guiding students or giving uh, webinars conducting webinars in colleges uh, what how do you think communities like us can uh, bring about more awareness or contribute uh, to the growth of this field um i don't know writing books right you know which uh, mm -hmm. which target indian leadership mm -hmm. a lot of i have a couple of books but uh, both are international editions Mm -hmm. I requested for India for Indian edition because the English ones are very expensive. Right, but that doesn't happen. Uh, but and also internships, the right the students can find their find their project in some Euro tech mm -hmm. company or yes. in a lab. Right? Uh, yeah, I think once we gain that momentum, it will have. A, Post effect that effect it will become self sustained. It will grow on its own. Maybe in the next couple of years it should really be 
very different scenario. Yeah. It is growing exponentially. Do you think something like a, a, a comprehensive database of opportunities in India for Indians would be uh, something that would uh, help people uh, get into the field more? But obviously, for that, we would need collaborators, for example, labs yes. or yes. startups, yes. which is quite a big uh, organization, which requires a lot of planning and organization, definitely. But, but we can start somewhere and let it grow, let information grow. Because, uh, for example, Kartik once gave me a list of uh, companies working in Parkinson's disease space. Right. It's a pretty long list of some 30 40 companies. Right. In fact, I wanted to write to each one of them because we do a lot of work in Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. But I never got to do it even now. So, laziness is another big obstacle. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm surprised that there are so many companies. Yeah. Right. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it can be done. It, uh, once you start somewhere, it will grow very quickly. What will mm -hmm. go around? It. Yes, there are actually, uh, I was recently attending uh, Neurotech X uh, Global uh, Buzz and Review, which is an event which uh, recaps, uh, gives a recap of everything that happened in the field industry and academia, as well as the community uh, over the past year. And uh, I think the statistics were that around, there are, there are around 1,500 Neurotech companies. 1,500 wow. is a very big number. And, yeah, very I can share a few, uh, uh, what do you say, data, uh, I mean, reviews or reports with you. It's a, sure. a very interesting read, actually, and something that uh, opened my mind as to that a lot of companies are moving beyond neuropharma and uh, focusing yeah. on consumer tech. Uh, it's, it's exciting. So um, yeah. another uh, topic that has been gaining a lot of traction is making journals open access because I think that is very important uh, when it comes yeah. to uh, uh, being involved in research as well as uh, reading about uh, things and if someone wants to uh, develop their experience on their own. Um, yeah. And recently, uh, the Nature Neuroscience Journal announced that uh, uh, to make a journal article openly accessible, they would uh, charge around twelve thousand dollars per article. Uh, what yeah, are your yeah. comments on this? Yeah, so I, it's become a real problem because uh, we publish many papers in what's called Frontiers Network, mm -hmm. and the typical cost is close to three thousand. Rupees but or dollars? Because we come from dollars, sorry. Dollars. Yes, sir. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, because we come from a third world, we sometimes get a discount. True, yes. That can be around 600 to 800 dollars, and that's still a problem. Mm -hmm. But 3000 is unimposable. Right? True. Yeah. Now, uh, I've heard of 4000, 5000, but 12000 is no problem. Yeah, it's a very that interesting. Isn't. Uh, this I is think to it's make it <laughs> because nobody will be able to publish. It's like education. Mm -hmm. The talented student should be given opportunity to learn, to study, right, irrespective of the financial situation. So this is uh, creating an artificial bottleneck uh, in science, and obviously, it's not undesirable. Right? Mm -hmm. So, I don't know what is the hope. So, how do you think? Uh, publications uh, could approach the idea of making journals open access, openly accessible without uh, the authors bearing the brunt of it? So first of all, I don't understand. Why should the publication, online publication cost so much? True. That is because, because we write the paper, we spend all the money on research. And reviewers do the reviews also for free. They are not paid. Yes. Mm -hmm. All that this will have to do is take that file and put it up on the website. Exactly. Once you have the website framework, it costs nothing. Mm -hmm. True. Why do they charge so much for just putting up a file on a website? Yes. All right. So there was a time when I uh, you know, yeah. So ideally, they should pay the researchers, you know. <laughs> 
But anyway, so why uh, is this whole model uh, still not challenged? And why exactly is this something that everyone's agreeing to? Or there is no large movement to overturn this? No, there is a large movement which is taking us to this point, which is absurd. The reason is, like I said, it's all a quantification of research. So you think only when you have those numbers, the research is good enough. Mm -hmm. Right, just like your GPA business. Mm -hmm. So to so each journal has an impact factor, and unless you publish in those journals, your mm -hmm. work is not good enough. So you cannot look at your work uh, as a standalone thing. It's only as good as a journal where it is published. Right, which is absurd, but that's not true. So individual scientists have been fighting this. There have been groups who boycotted this kind of, you know, mm -hmm. uh, exploitation, right? And mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of financial burden which academics won't be able to you know, bear. Right. But administrations all over the world are pushing this, pushing for this. Because it makes uh, decisions easy. Which is higher, which is lower, how do you do higher, right? And it makes, uh, you know, it will also take the college rankings up. Everything is numbers, right? There are a lot of faculty publishing in top journals, then the college ratings go up. Yes. College ratings go up. Uh, most students will take, choose their college over others. Mm -hmm. Most students come and get more income through tuition fees. So that's a vicious circle. Yes. So somebody has to break it. I mean, but I don't know. But there's a problem. Yeah. It's quite absurd. It is. Um... So yes, uh, the last question would be that what advice would you have for all the neurotech enthusiasts? Or anyone yeah. who is trying to get into the field of neurotech or neuroscience? 